modernism, kind of where it came from, why, what was it reacting against, um, as well as kind of what are some of the unifying characteristics of it. Um, kind of more on a national level, looping in Southern California briefly, and then kind of leading that into Justin's more regional context and case study um, discussion. So while the specific beginnings of postmodern architecture in America may vary, it is widely accepted that the style has its roots in the 1960s. By that point, numerous prominent architects had already begun pushing back against the ubiquity of banal blue glass high rises that were increasingly populating the skylines of cities across the country. As architecture critic Martin Filler put it, the nuanced modernism practiced by studied practitioners like Mies van der Rohe was being ever more imitated by speculators who, quote, saw minimalism not as a medium for elegant simplification and technical specification, but only as an opportunity for cheaper, easier, and therefore more profitable real estate development. Mm -hmm. Among those, I'm gonna, okay. Sorry about that, the slide didn't move. Okay, great. Among those searching for a new aesthetic were figures such as Paul Rudolph, Louis Kahn, and Romaldo Gergola, whose new brutalist designs were largely without ornament or obvious historic reference, but responded honestly to a given site and program rather than being defined by the strictures of international corporate modernism. Others like Eero Saarinen and Buckminster Fuller similarly challenged the conventions of orthodox modernism during the 50s and 60s, with designs embodying a search for a unique approach to futuristic emotive architecture. A contemporary of these figures, Robert Venturi took yet another tact in breaking away. Born and raised in Philadelphia, Venturi studied under the Beaux-Arts oriented Jean Labatou at Princeton in the late 1940s. He would tour Europe for two years before returning to work as a teaching assistant to Louis Kahn at the University of Pennsylvania. Gently rejecting both late modernism and Kahn's heroic brutalism, by 1966, Venturi had already completed two of the foundational works of postmodern architecture, the Vanna Venturi House and the Guild House, both of which were built in his native city. While these early examples were key, it was perhaps the publication of Venturi's complexity and contradiction in architecture that best demonstrated his challenges to modernism and propelled the growth of postmodern architecture forward. Essentially, a discussion of Venturi's personal preferences and the corresponding ideas behind his designs, the book was hailed by architectural historian Vincent Scully as, quote, the most important writing on the making of architecture since Le Corbusier's Toward in Architecture. Venturi advocated for an embrace of the complexities and inconsistencies inherent in modern society, as well as an understanding of architecture's past to serve as the roots of contemporary design. His soft manifesto against the dictums of late modernism called for a new aesthetic that was vibrant and humanist, would communicate meanings and references on multiple levels, and would be lacking in unity or clarity. He countered Mies van der Rohe's famous, less is more, with the statement that less is a bore. Following its initial release in 1966, complexity and contradiction angered many in the architectural community, including Kahn but it would influence the ideas of younger professionals in the field and help initiate a broader groundswell. An economic recession from 1973 to 1975 affected the profession severely with commissions dropping dramatically. Architects, particularly those who were younger and or entering the field, questioned the prevailing ideologies and sought new modes of design that might lead to popular support and a corresponding rise in projects. One common choice was to revert to more traditional forms with the belief that these features would allow the public to better understand and appreciate a given design. A former practitioner of pure modernism throughout the 60s, Michael Graves made such a turn in the 70s. This is perhaps best reflected in the design of his personal residence in Princeton, a remodel of an old warehouse that included a variety of traditional forms, plinths, columns, fluted pilasters, heavily rusticated walls. To avoid rote imitation, however, he distorted those forms through treatments such as incorporating a steel molding profile into the cut squares of the walls and topping pilasters with a keystone rather than capital. As Venturi sought to do with the Guildhouse, 
This represented a blending of historical references with the general architectural language of modernism. Graves would go on to complete the Portland Public Service Building several years later. This design carried these ideas even further and remains one of postmodernism's most important works. It was added to the National Register in 2011 under Criterion C and Criteria Consideration G for its exceptional significance. The jury, now working largely with Denise Scott Brown, produced designs throughout the 70s with examples such as the addition to the Allen Memorial Art Museum in Ohio and the Tucker House, each of which embody the principles they had outlined, thereby giving physical forms to those only aware of postmodernism via text. Charles Moore had been addressing context and experience of buildings or sites throughout the 50s and 60s, but he too would tie his designs to the style beginning in the mid-70s. This was done most prominently through the Piazza d'Italia in New Orleans, arguably the most emblematic work of postmodern architecture in America. As Justin will detail shortly, the rise of postmodernism in Los Angeles and its environs also began during the late 70s and early 80s. While the historicist characteristics discussed here could certainly be found in postmodern LA, it is notable that this specific common aspect was somewhat skewed in favor of a greater focus on a more general camp or hypothetical visions of the future. By the 1980s, postmodernism had become the defining form of high style architecture in America. Although this continued into the early 90s, postmodernism was quickly vulgarized, robbed of its intellectual rigor and populist concerns, mm -hmm. used in the very corporate architecture the style's founders had railed against. Postmodernism quickly became a public relations sign, accomplishing little else than denoting a building as of the time. Some of its most prominent practitioners were complicit in this figurative and occasionally literal disnification of postmodernism's originally counterculture aesthetic. Denise Scott Brown succinctly summarized the process in 2006, stating that, quote, architectural postmodernism started as a sincere attempt to confront issues regarding popular culture, symbolism, and communication in the automobile city, yet it was soon hijacked by commercial interests and used by their architecture to create signature architecture shorn of social content. Despite this, postmodernism Postmodernism is significant in the scope of American architecture for having been the first relatively cohesive style to widely supplant post-war late modernism, as well as for having visibly returned historical motifs to the profession. The individuals associated with the style, many of their designs, and the ideas behind them would go on to influence high style architecture, as well as broader movements such as new urbanism into the 2000s. Given this broad context, how then might American postmodernism be defined? When in scope of history does the style fall? And given that postmodernism refers to a variety of related yet distinct architectural approaches or manners, what might the unifying and character defining elements of these various manners be? I'd argue that postmodern architecture generally spanned the years from 1960 and 1995 with its peak of influence, notoriety, and volume of designs concentrated between 76 and the late 80s. By the close of the 80s, the ideologies underpinning the various manners of postmodernism had been thoroughly commodified, with built examples that generally abandoned these principles in search for a quick, profitable commissions and tacked on traditional forms solely to denote the structure as contemporary. Architects also would begin supplanting postmodernism with new approaches. From the many designs referred to under the collective umbrella of architecture, to lead certification seeking green building, to the more literal, undifferentiated new classical architecture practiced by various professionals, including form, former stalwarts of postmodernism like Robert Stern. In regards to the underlying features that characterize the variety of postmodern approaches, populism may be considered first and foremost. Though that term has carried certain unrelated connotations in recent months, I use it here to describe postmodernism's reaction against the tedium of corporate modernism and the style's resulting embrace of the human experience. This could be achieved in any number of ways. Postmodern historicist designs featured reinterpretations of traditional forms which recognized the commonality and familiarity of these elements, but incorporated them in novel and unexpected fashions, 
as with the broken pediments and distorted columns that typified the manor, or as a specific example, the fluted Tuscan order expressed via circular water features. These historic elements might also be mixed with those that were readily contemporary. In Learning from Las Vegas, Venturi and Scott Brown's follow-up to Complexity and Contradiction, the author suggested that architects should begin to learn from pop art and that it, quote, is perhaps best from the everyday landscape, vulgar and disdained, that we can draw the complex and contradictory order that is valid and vital for our architecture as an urbanist whole. This alludes to the consideration and respect of the vernacular, but more particularly for an embrace of popular culture and its associated bright, loud commercial chaos. As such, in postmodernism, one can regularly find traditional, albeit reinterpreted, features located adjacent to oversized signs, neon, splashy colors, or tacked on to a purely utilitarian structure. Many have also pointed these and other characteristics out as postmodernism's love of camp, which was famously defined by Susan Sontag as a, quote, sensibility that revels in artifice, stylization, theatricalization, irony, playfulness, and exaggeration rather than content. One may argue that this sensibility was in fact vital to the content of postmodern architecture, but this is nonetheless a significant aspect of not just postmodern historicism, but other manners as well. Moore designed a public square that has been described as a bizarro movie set. Venturi housed senior citizens in an oversized TV box. And Graves adorned the turquoise colonnade at the base of the public service building with a 35-foot-tall Portlandia sculpture. Frank Gehry may not have embraced the staples of historic architecture in the way others did, but the function of playfulness and deception are clear in his early Southern California planner designs as well. From the jarring, uneven interplay between the historical home and its new skin at the Geary residence, seen in the top left, to the eccentricity and exaggerated ornamentation of the Dorn House at the right, to the entry arch created by the gigantic binocular sculpture mounted at the facade of the Chai Day building. When it comes to camp, one would be remiss also not to consider the Lagerberger Company building in Newark, Ohio, simply an oversized version of the company's handcrafted maplewood baskets. As will be discussed in fuller detail shortly, even John Portman's Bonaventure Hotel, quite distinct in appearance from these other modes of postmodern architecture, Riley reflected the surrounding city across its exterior while creating an isolated micro-utopia at the closed-off interior. This overall embrace of traditional forms, camp, and or the vernacular served a broader purpose in postmodern architects' efforts to design projects that could communicate meaning appealing to audiences both high and low. In their efforts to move past the pureness of geometry or focus on profit, practitioners encouraged multiple and simultaneous readings that would increase a given's, given work's expression. By employing certain hallmarks of modernism as well as past styles as they saw fit, Postmodern architects could demonstrate that modernism had now become passé, thus it was their aesthetic that was to be the future of the field. Allusions and references can be employed in any number of ways in order to fit a given project and its content and context. As historian Charles Jenks put it in his duly titled Language of Postmodern Architecture, quote, obviously, if an architect has nothing important to say, his facility with communication is just going to advertise this fact. A multivalent architecture, opposed to a univalent building, combines meanings imaginatively so they fuse and modify each other. A multivalent architecture makes full use of the full arsenal of communicational means, leaving out no area of experience and suppressing no particular code. One may certainly question the efficacy of any given project, but postmodernism's elaborate expression of ornament and meaning was at least intended to humanize the built environment creating a rich, diverting social experience for all individuals. Postmodernism, postmodern architecture was and is critiqued for its own elitism, rife with in-jokes and mockery. But while there are certainly exceptions, the style's pr practitioners strove for quite the opposite. Venturi's previously mentioned incorporation of an enlarged television antenna atop the guildhouse was to double as a winking variation on the decor to be found atop classical pediments while more readily serving as a symbol of the aged. Vilified as a cruel joke made at the expense of the building's residence, it was removed shortly after the property's completion, 
despite its inclusion having been done quite not, not quote, not hatefully, but loving. Venturi clarified that it was not meant the way it was interpreted and that it was rather not for the architects to comment on whether or not television is bad, merely representing the function of the property. Moore's Piazza d'Italia exemplifies the multivalent characteristic perhaps better than any other work. Commissioned as a living monument to the underrepresented Italian American community of New Orleans, the piazza was to honor that demographic while also serving to help revitalize an area of the city that saw nearly 100 demolitions over a four month period. The central 80 foot long fountain forms a relief of Italy with a large Roman rostra at the foot of Sicily. Multiple screen walls represent distorted versions of the five classical orders, each of them embracing water in some way or another. Connected via the flying buttresses of Gothic churches, the vibrant colors of the screen walls allowed for pop appeal, while simultaneously alluding to the tone of Greco-Roman masonry materials. Black and white rings at the base of the plaza explicitly referenced the cladding of the adjacent Likes Tower and extended out into the street to beckon passersby into the space. Ample neon lended more splashes of pop culture while also helping to light the public space at night. Latin texts along the fascia of the screen walls communicated a much more literal meaning, translating as St. Joseph's Fountain, and this fountain is dedicated as a gift to all people of New Orleans. In the mode of Benjamin Latrobe, Moore even invented his own sixth order at the portico. He would dub it the delicatessen order as it was intended to frame the hanging meats of a future butcher that was to be among the commercial tenants surrounding the piazza. While the complex abundant expression of the site comes from so many different symbols, signs, and meanings that the general expression could be difficult to grasp, attempting to do so is only one option. One may instead choose to revel in the simple, simple pleasures offered through the warm hues, trickling water, and the familiarity of the classical orders which Moore thought of much like music notes. One can put forth the effort to investigate and understand the multitude of clashing simultaneous meanings if they so wish, but enjoying the work on a basic level of experience, of appearance and experience is a viable alternative. Finally, I would suggest the postmodernism is united through an avoidance of high quality, durable construction. This reduced project time and costs while allowing postmodern architects to incorporate all the ornamentation and illusions they desired without diminishing financial feasibility. Designs were therefore typically low cost relative to others of a similar scale and generally used alternative materials and methods of construction. The downside of this approach, however, has been the rapid decay of some of the style's most significant examples. Maintenance is a chronic issue with buildings of any style but the speed with which works of postmodernism have fallen into disrepair is clear. Postmodern architecture was not designed with any specific intent to be temporary, but enduring construction was not a true priority or consideration. For example, the Portland Public Service Building was completed roughly 35 years ago at a cost of 25 million and now requires an estimated rehabilitation of 95 million. One must, of course, recognize the impact of Hurricane Katrina, but the Piazza d'Italia has suffered dramatic deterioration despite having been fully restored in 2004. As will be discussed at the conclusion of this presentation, this characteristic creates a meaningful wrinkle for preservation professionals. If I were to try to offer a succinct definition of postmodern architecture in America, it would be that at its peak from the 1970s to 1990, postmodern architecture rejected the alleged banality of modernism in search for the profession's new way forward. Though practitioners approach this in a variety of ways, postmodernism's various modes were unified through an embrace of popular culture, communicative architectural expressions, and the richness of the human experience. Despite the style having been rapidly stripped of its ideological background, it is significant as the first relatively enduring break for modern architecture in America. Thank you, John, for that great um, introduction to sort of the history of postmodernism, along with um, sort of a working definition for postmodernism. Um, my name is Justin Greving. I'm a preservation planner with the city of San Francisco. Um, but I did do my undergraduate training at UCLA, and I lived in Los Angeles for a while um, while working for a preservation firm. So I've always been interested in Los Angeles um, as a city and um, my interest in postmodernism largely comes from 
um, wanting to understand where it springs out from the modern architectural movement. So in my presentation, I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna pull out some case studies in Los Angeles in postmodern architecture, um, and then we'll open up the, the webinar for discussion later. So the first slide that I want to talk to you about is the Getty Villa, which is on the PCH. It was completed in 1974, and it was designed by Robert Langdon and Ernest Wilson in consultation with Stephen Garrett and an archaeologist, Norman Neuerberg. I know some of you might not think about this being a, an example of postmodern architecture, but I think the date of construction sort of clearly places it within the realm of postmodern sort of considerations. A little bit about the two architects. Robert Langdon was born in Iowa and he studied at Yale. Um, he graduated from USC School of Architecture in 1944. Ernest Wilson also went to USC for architecture, and I would say that both architects are not really known for their postmodern constructions, but one of the buildings they did was the Glendale Federal Savings Building in Beverly Hills. Um, so the Getty Villa is interesting as a, an attempt to replicate a Villa del Papiri, which was an ancient Herculanean villa. Um, and when J. Paul Getty was envisioning this museum to hold his vast collection of classical and Renaissance art, he didn't feel that it was appropriate to house them in what he called a modern building. So the Getty Villa itself is much more than just the design of the house, but it also encompasses sort of a surrounding landscape of manicured gardens, and as you can see, this giant pool, in the, which is kind of the focal point for the museum, um, along with being located in the Mediterranean climate of Southern California. He's a, attempting to recreate sort of like the full visual and tactile experience of living in a Roman villa. The second case study that I wanted to talk to you, which is one that John mentioned previously, is the Bonaventure Hotel. I think this one is particularly interesting um, just because it's always used as a case study in sort of high academic criticism um, of postmodernism and uh, sort of like late capitalist society. So it was designed by John Portman and Associates and it was completed in 1976. It's located um, downtown Los Angeles. A little bit about the architect himself. He graduated from the Georgia Institute of Technology in 1950. And John Portman himself is known mostly for his sort of large scale urban structures such as the Bonaventure Hotel. He's also known for the Peachtree Center, which is in his hometown in Atlanta. Um, and up in San Francisco, we have the Embarcadero Hyatt. So I wanted to pull out two quotes from um, two critical theorists, Frederick Jameson and Edward Soja, who both talk about the Bonaventure Hotel as being sort of these, um, a perfect example of postmodern society. Um, so Soja in his book, Postmodern Geographies, the reassertion of space and critical social theory states that the Bonaventure represents, quote, a con concentrated representation of the restructured spatiality of the late capitalist city, fragmented and fragmenting, homogenous and homogenizing, divergently packaged yet curiously incomprehensible, seemingly open in presenting itself to view, but constantly pressing to enclose, to compartmentalize, to circumscribe, and to incarcerate. Entry by land is forbidding to those who carelessly walk, but entrance is nevertheless encouraged at many levels. Once inside, however, it becomes daunting to get out again without bureaucratic assistance. In so many ways, its architecture recapitulates and reflects the sprawling manufactured spaces of Los Angeles. So the Bonaventure Hotel represents kind of a, an ultimate rejection of the surrounding urban fabric of the city with its monolithic reflective glass curtain wall and its hidden entries. Um, according to Frederick Jameson in his book, Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, he discusses the entrances in some more detail. So he states, there are three entrances to the Bonaventure, one from Figueroa and the other two by way of elevated gardens on the north side of the hotel, which is built into the remaining slope of the former Bunker Hill. None of these is anything like the old Hotel Marquis or the monumental Port Cochere, with which the sumptuous buildings of yesteryear were wont to stage your passage from street to the interior. Instead, he states, the Bonaventure aspires to be a total space, a complete world, a kind of min mini miniature city. To this new total space, meanwhile, corresponds a new collective practice, 
a new mode in which individuals move and congregate. In this sense then, ideally, the mini city of Portman's Bonaventure ought not to have entrances at all, since the entryway is always the seam that links the building to the rest of the city that surrounds it. For it does not wish to be part of the city, but rather its equivalent and replacement or substitute. So I think the Bonaventure represents sort of that, that perfect attempt to recreate an entire city that in itself is a whole being separate from the surrounding built environment. As you can see, there are sort of, it's very difficult to ascertain where the entrances are in this building. Another case study that I wanted to talk to you about is a restaurant in Beverly Hills. It's the Kate Mantellini restaurant. It was completed in 1987. Um, and the restaurant itself was designed by Tom Main and Michael Rotundi. It was uh, an alteration of an earlier sort of high modern style bank building located in Beverly Hills. Um, Tom Main and Michael Rotundi both helped found SciArc with the goal of creating an architecture school that was more focused on um, social issues. And they wanted to create an architecture school that was a little bit more experimental. Um, they also partnered at some point to create the firm Morphosis, and Tom Main is still the head of that architecture firm. But what's interesting to look at is their earlier work, which included a lot of restaurant interior spaces in Los Angeles in the um, sort of mid-1980s. So the restaurant itself is named after a boxing promoter from the early 1920s, and it was opened by the owners of Hamburger Hamlet. Um, <clears throat> so the architect architects transformed not only the exterior, but also the interior spaces. Um, according to Michael Rotundi, he said, the owner wanted to create a 24-hour roadside steakhouse for the future, a 1950s diner updated, a place where cab drivers hang out, a very accessible space. And then he adds, and she wanted a clock. So it's also interesting to look at um, articles that talked about the restaurant in the 1980s after it opened. Um, according to the Los Angeles Times article in the food section, they said, Restaurateurs are realizing that dining out is an experience that goes beyond the food and having a visually engaging setting in, may in some cases be more important than the meal. The design of the recently opened Kate Mantellini provides an excellent illustration of this point. So it's interesting to note this is another situation where you have the architects trying to create a sort of wholly transformative space. Um, on the, the image to the left, you can see there's a 14 foot diameter skylight um, and in which there is pierced a large orrery, which is a mechanical system to simulate the movement of celestial bodies. In this restaurant, they also incorporated a large mural of a boxing match. And you can also see there's an additional piece of artwork that's sort of juxtaposed below the large skylight, which was um, a depiction of a very famous boxing match from 1985. Mm -hmm. Moving on to sort of maybe traditional architectural understanding of postmodernism, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Beverly Hills Civic Center, which is located in Beverly Hills. Um, the large addition was completed um, between the late 1980s and 1990 by Charles Moore. Um, Charles Moore is probably one of the most well-known architects in postmodernism. He studied at Princeton, where he got his master's and PhD in 1957, um, and he taught at a number of different architectural schools throughout the nation. Some of his earlier collaborations with other Bay Area architects include Sea Ranch, which is designed in the Third Bay tradition, um, along with the Kresge College in University of California, Santa Cruz, which could be described as a sort of a postmodern campus. Um, these are sort of prior to the more exuberant postmodern style, which you can see here at the uh, Beverly Hills Civic Center where um, Charles Moore has sort of pulled an ornamentation of the original 1932 building for expansion of the Civic Center in the 1990s. Um, it's interesting to note how he's sort of pulled a lot of the architectural vocabulary from the 1932 building and uh, expanded it to create um, three different plazas with uh, additional municipal, municipal buildings. Um, and this is just a direct quote from Charles Moore. He said, he wanted to create a place that is distinguishable in mind and memory from other places. So again, you have this idea where um, the architect is attempting to create sort of a full environment of architecture using not only the architectural space, but also the sort of mimicry of the architectural vocabulary, which is pulling directly from the adjacent property. 
I also wanted to talk about um, two of Frank Gehry's projects. He probably doesn't need an introduction, um, but this is the Loyola Law School, which was designed by Frank Gehry, um, completed in the 1990s. He did attend USC School of Architecture, where he got a bachelor in 1954. Um, he worked for a number of years in Los Angeles for Victor Gruen and Associates. Um, and then Frank Gehry actually started his own practice in 1962. As John mentioned, one of his sort of most important works is actually his own uh, house, which was a 1920s bungalow that he kind of adapted um, as part of a renovation. So the Loyola Law School represents sort of a postmodern interpretation of a traditional campus, and it's a wholly executed vision of Frank Gehry that was completed in 1990. To the left, you'll see the main building, which is known in the Bur as the Burns Building, and it features a large projecting staircase extending from the facade. The purpose, according to Frank Gehry, was I took the stairways that would normally have been inside and spilled them onto the outside of the building with the idea that it would animate the facade and bring people out to the front of the building, animating the building with human beings. When classes break, you see the front of the building covered with people running up and down the stairs that complements the people walking around in the space below and gives it a lot more excitement. To the right, um, another building to note is the Hall of the 1970s which has its sort of referential giant colonnade. Um, so here you have sort of an interesting take on postmodern architecture where you can see he's pulling cues from earlier architectural styles, but you can still tell that this is definitely a, a, an early version of a Frank Gehry structure. This is another um, property. This is the Chiat Day building. It's located in Venice, um, also designed by Frank Gehry in collaboration with Claes Oldenburg and Kushi Van Bruggen, who are the sculptors of the giant binoculars that you see here. Um, I remember when I was studying at the University of Virginia, one of my professors, Richard Guy Wilson said, you know, the most frustrating part of this building is you can't tell where the darn entrance is. Um, as John's image indicated, the entrance is actually located directly below where the binoculars are, and you can see the curb cut indicating where that is. But I think this also represents, uh, is sort of a demonstration of this attempt to create this like all encompassing space that almost rejects the surrounding urban environment. Um, but as John mentioned, again, this is kind of a, a more playful take on postmodernism through this sort of giant use of a large binocular as the sort of focal point for this building. Sort of to, to take the uh, postmodern to its furthest extreme, we have the 777 Tower, which is also located downtown. It was completed in 1990 by Cesar Pelli, um, who was an Argentinian American architect. Um, he attended the University of Illinois, where he received his MS in architecture in 1954. Cesar Pelli, Pelli also worked for Gruen Associates in LA in 1968 and later served as the dean of the uh, School of Architecture at Yale. Some of his other important works, including one in Los Angeles, includes our city of West Hollywood is the Pacific Design Center, which is again a very sort of fully executed version of postmodern architecture, along with the Petronas Towers in Malaysia. So I would say Caesar Pelli has also become known for his kind of skyscrapers. Um, this example with the 777 Tower is an interesting sort of late iteration of postmodernism. But you can see in the details of the building on the upper left image where you have a, sort of a depiction of Munton and Mullion patterns that were probably otherwise not necessary. Um, in addition to the use of a more detailed cornice line on these three stepped areas where you can see there are sort of clean um, lines that do have some sort of vague references to previous architectural styles. Um, so this isn't the sort of like the direct referential postmodernism of something like the AT&T Tower by Philip Johnson. Um, but there clearly are sort of pulling cues from early modern architectural styles. As the last case study, I wanted to pull out sort of the <clears throat> sort of the final iteration of postmodernism. This is um, called Brentwood Place. This is located on Wilshire Boulevard. It was completed in 1999. I'm not sure um, if there was an architect. It's unknown at this point. Um, but I think that this is the sort of the, the 
where postmodern ends, I would say, in sort of the trajectory of architectural history, you can see they're definitely pulling from the language of postmodern architecture in their use of a number of different architectural styles and sort of a display of variety of different architectural vocabulary. Um, but I would sort of beg the question as to whether that this has any meaning or is it just sort of an applied style to what would otherwise be sort of a simple stucco building. Um, I think this also sort of points to maybe a different form of postmodern architecture where you have um, examples like Americana on Brand in Glendale and the Grove in Los Angeles, which were both sort of designed and envisioned by the developer Rick Caruso. Um, Again, I feel like both of those uh, shopping malls sort of speak to an attempt to create an all-encompassing space uh, for people that sort of rejects the surrounding urban fabric. Um, in conclusion, I would say there are uh, some of these examples sort of are, are interesting in that they have um, earlier architectural buildings that are used as sort of reference points such as Beverly Hills Civic Center um, and even Frank Gehry's own house. Um, and I would say that uh, the question of sort of the significance of postmodern architecture also comes into play as a lot of these buildings are probably less than 50 years old. But as John mentioned, um, how do we talk about these properties now that they are coming of age? So kind of just discussion points, you know, we have a variety of things. So some of these, you know, haven't been constructed in the late eighties, early nineties, but some of them now uh, over 50 years old. And then certainly things like the Portland Public Service Building already listed on the National Register, at least for the time being um, at 35, but some of um, Venturi's works are, are already hitting 50. The piazza is getting closer, but then we have things that are much later on. So kind of when as a profession, uh, is it appropriate to start trying to evaluate and interpret postmodernism? I mean, given context of a style, um, maybe we need more remove um, in order to place the context of the style um, together, or um, does that risk losing some of the most significant and kind of early emblematic sites? Um, another question with postmodernism, as I discussed in terms of the quality of construction, this isn't likely an issue with every work, certainly. But there are many, especially some of these early ones, that just weren't necessarily built to last. Um, so as the field of preservation, how do we kind of appropriately and authentically approach um, sites that were not built with the intent to last, to last for decade after decade after decade? And if the authentic answer is, do we let them kind of just fall into disrepair or, or, or allow them to be replaced? How do we justify that with the existing parameters of our field? Um, and if we don't do that, um, how do we how do we um, argue that it's satisfying? I, I, it's just an interesting thing that the piazza is, is frequently called a, um, a architecturally designed ruin. It was built as a ruin, basically. So it's kind of a question of how do we authentically protect these sites when they were never meant to endure for for fifty or or even you know hundred or even fifty years. Um, and then kind of just generally, um, are the current tools from this, the Secretary of the Interior standards to our preservation briefs to local design guidelines, et cetera, are these adequate to um, identify, protect these sites? Um, does the style present unique challenges, be it through protection or be it through analyzing kind of alterations to these sites? Is there something about the style um, that, that presents unique challenges and how we apply our